Hi everybody and welcome to a new exciting video in the Generating Sound with Neural Networks series. If you remember from the previous video, we said that in order to move from uh, autoencoders to variational autoencoders, we have to modify both the encoder components and the loss function. In the previous video, we focused on the encoder components. Today, we're going to be focusing on the loss function. Now, just a quick disclaimer before we get started with the video itself. That is that in order to understand what I'm saying here, you probably need to check out my previous videos on autoencoders. Otherwise, most of the things that I'll be mentioning here will sound as gibberish. Let's get started with a simple representation of an autoencoder. You may remember that in an autoencoder, we have an image that we pass in through the autoencoder itself. The image gets encoded and then it gets decoded. And at the end of the architecture, we have a reconstructed image. What about the loss function for an autoencoder? Well, we already implemented that and we used the root mean square error. In other words, what we do is we compare the original image with the reconstructed image on a pixel by pixel base using root mean square error. The ultimate goal of our training process is that of minimizing the difference between the original and the reconstructed image. And for that, we use RMSC or root mean square error. The loss function for an autoencoder only has this reconstruction error or RMSC. Now, if we want to move from autoencoder to variational autoencoder in terms of the loss function, we need to add an extra term to the loss function, which is called the code back Leibler divergence or KL. If we now analyze this loss function, we see that we have two elements. RMSE, we're already familiar with it, will provide information about the reconstruction error, or in other words, how far apart the original and the reconstructed images are. Whereas KL or the Kullback Leibler divergence will provide us information regarding the difference between the normal distribution from the standard normal distribution. If you remember from the previous video, we said that the encoder of a variational autoencoder is going to find a normal distribution which is characterized by two parameters, the mean vector and the log variance vector. Now, KL analyzes the difference between that normal distribution from the standard normal distribution. Once again, if you need to understand why we need all of these normal distributions for the encoder part of a variational autoencoder, just go check out my previous video in the series. Now, let's try to understand a little bit better the kullback leibler divergence. Well, of course, what it does is measures the difference between two probability distributions. You may think that the kullback leibler divergence is some sort of distance, but it's not precisely a distance from a mathematical point of view, because in order to have a distance, we need for that construct to be symmetric. Take, for example, the Euclidean distance. The Euclidean distance between point A and point B is the same as that of point B and point A. Unfortunately, the Kubik uh, Leibler divergence doesn't enforce that symmetry. In other words, the Kubik Leibler divergence of distribution A and B it can be different from the kullback leibler divergence of distribution B and A. We can provide the kullback leibler divergence into different forms, but we are going to be using the so-called closed form, which can be used for normal distributions. Let's take a look at the mathematical formalization of the kullback leibler divergence. It's this bit of a formula here. Now, I don't want to get too much deep into this formula itself, but I want to give you a little bit of an intuition here. So now, first of all, we have these two N, capital N letters. What are they? Well, this is the normal distribution, and you may recognize the mu, that's like the, the mean value or mean vector, and sigma, that's the uh, variance vector. And then we have N in 0 and 1, which is the standard normal uh, distribution. Okay. 
So what about the formula itself? Well, we have a sum symbol there. And this means that we want to sum across all the dimensions of the latent space. So for each dimension that we have in the latent space of our autoencoder, we are going to create, uh, we are going to calculate this expression. So for example, if we have five uh, dimensions in the latent space, we're going to calculate the expression in green five times, one for each, across each dimension. Let's just go back to the loss function. So let's recap like this now. The loss function of a variational autoencoder has two terms. One is the reconstruction error, and this is the same term that we also used in vanilla autoencoders. The second term is the kullback leibler divergence, which provides us information about the difference between the normal distribution identified by the encoder and the standard normal distribution. Now, what does this kullback leibler divergence term do in the end? Well, the basic idea is that the KL loss term penalizes observations where the mean and the log variance vectors differ significantly from the standard normal distribution. In other words, what the KL loss term tries to achieve is to pull back a normal distribution towards a standard normal distribution. And that happens when we have the min vector that's equal to zero and the log variance vector again is equal to zero. If both of those conditions are achieved, then the K loss KL loss term goes down to zero. And we have basically that the normal distribution now coincides completely with the standard normal distribution. Now you may be wondering, but why do we need this? Why do we need to add this extra term, the KL a loss term? The kullback leibler divergence term fixes a couple of issues that we had with vanilla autoencoders. That happens because we now have a normal distribution that gets pulled towards the origin of the latent space. By doing so, we ensure that the normal distribution that now tries to resemble as much as possible a standard normal distribution is centered around the origin of the latent space and then it has symmetrical cluster of points around the origin. This achieves two things. First, we now have symmetry around the origin of the latent space and this basically means that we avoid having all those gaps that we had among the cluster of points so that we have something that resembles an almost continuous space uh, around the origin. There's one final touch to add to the loss function of a variational autoencoder, and that's the reconstruction loss weight, which in this case we indicate with alpha. Alpha is a real value, and we find out that finding the correct value for alpha is tough. And why is it tough? Well, because we have to strike a delicate balance between having it too big and having it too small. Now, if alpha is too small, we're going to have poorly reconstructed images. And why is that the case? Well, because if alpha is too small, then the KL term of the loss function is going to be very impactful across the all loss function and then the reconstruction, reconstruction loss is going to be completely negligible. On the other hand, if alpha is too large, we're going to have all the same issues that we've had so far with vanilla autoencoders. And that's because the KL term will be negligible because all the weight will be on the reconstruction loss. We need to find a value for alpha that strikes the balance between ensuring that we take care of having well formed images or well reconstructed images and ensuring that we have a normal distribution that resembles a standard normal distribution. And this is uh, informed by the KL term in the loss function. We can find an ideal value for alpha, treating it as a hyperparameter that we want to optimize during training time. Great, now you should have all the theoretical tools for understanding how we move from a vanilla autoencoder 
towards a variational autoencoder. In the previous video, we saw how we needed to improve the encoder itself. And in this video, we focused on the improvements that we need to apply to the loss function. That's great. So what's next? Well, in the next video, we're going to take all of these theoretical concepts that we devised during this couple of videos, and we're going to implement them. In other words, we're going to go back to our uh, autoencoder class and we're going to implement the encoder and the loss function to transform it into a variational autoencoder. Okay, that's all for today. I hope you found this video useful. If that's the case, please leave a like. If you want to get more videos like this, please remember to subscribe to the Sound of AI channel. Cheers for now.